Fat Hoops, the show where we talk to American college basketball players about their time playing hoops at home and abroad. Before we get into today's talk, be sure to help Expat Hoops grow, hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell to be alerted for when Expat Hoops has new content. Today, we're talking to former Arizona State player Shaq McKissick. Well, he was the All-Pac-12 honorable mention in 2015 as a three-time Turkish League All-Star and is currently playing for Greek powerhouse Olympiakos in the EuroLeague. We are thrilled to have Shaq on the show today. Welcome to Expat Hoops. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really good intro. <laughs> we yeah, try I, a, I uh, you know, you stum- be, may it ever be so stumbly. It is an intro. As it is. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. It's all, it's all downhill from here. Um, <laughs> so you were um, recruited by and played for Coach Sendek. What was, what was that process like uh, in terms of him preparing you for uh, an overseas career or even just, just basketball? Um, well, if I can remember, I think me and him had the same agent or his agent is close friends with my agent. So that's kind of how I got my foot in the door um, with uh, with overseas basketball. And it's a funny story. Uh, my first year in Italy, my agent tells me this story 10 times a year. He's like, um, yeah, I put the coach on with Herb. And Herb was like, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm Herb Shindek, the coach of Arizona State. I, I coach James Harden. And the Italian coach immediately just because of, like, whoa, 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 you say James Harden? And then my agent always jokes like that could have been any Joe Schmo from around the corner and they just ate it all up. So <laughs> it was like he didn't hear anything after James Harden. I had the, the contract after that. But um, no, the the way the way that I look at Herb, like I, I put all my coaches in chronological order and he for sure would have to be at the top just because he was the first to me, like father figure that that I just kind of embraced um, super, super rough um super hard uh perfectionist no shortcuts um and it really just kind of instilled into me like just a lifestyle that you know to to get where you want to be you got to do all the tough things you know there's no shortcuts there's no days off and you just kind of got to get it done so and and he's also the only coach that every holiday he texts me whether it's father's day christmas um i don't know not halloween but uh every other <laughs> holiday he, he pretty much um messaged me but we keep in we keep in contact maybe four or five times a year which is to me that's an extreme um large number as far as compared to other teammates that i play with hmm. interesting um one of the things actually i think you brought it up uh has the same agent uh that was one of the things we want to get into in terms of all right, you graduated after, you know, having a really good senior season, 12.4 points, uh, 4.7 rebounds with the Sun Devils. So, all right, your season's over. Uh, start looking to the next thing. Uh, what was your thought process then in terms of NBA, EuroLeague, or, or going overseas? And um, you kind of maybe alluded to it, but in terms of looking for an agent, what was that process like for you? Um, I mean, I think for every kid in America, they want to go to the NBA. But I had a good friend, uh, Jermaine Marshall, rest in peace, who passed away um, about a year and a half ago um, in France. He was playing second division there, but um, we also had the same agent. So my second year that I got granted, he was already playing in Italy. So he was already giving me the rundown um, about this and about that. So I was already preparing my mind um, to play overseas. Um, Of course, I knew I was going to go to summer league, but I think just deep down at that point in time at where I was at in my life, I was extremely nervous, anxious, and afraid to take that leap Um, just based off of just telling myself every day, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. These guys work so hard. You're not good enough. Like you've gotten this far. You're not getting any further. So just already transition uh, your mind to overseas. And that's kind of what happened. Like I got in the games. I just wouldn't shoot. Everybody's telling me to shoot the ball. And I'm just like, Nah, I guess I'm a point guard now because I'm just passing it to everybody. And um, they were about to sign me to a um, uh, to a training camp deal uh, with money. I think it was like sixty five thousand dollars. This was all talks before summer camp or summer league. And then after that, I just never heard from them again. So it was just like I, I just didn't embrace the moment how I should have. And um, so that so transition transitioning from that um, to finally getting to Italy. I was, I was happy, you know, um, I wasn't a big flyer before ASU, but after you take so many flights every single week, you're just like, all right, it is what it is. So, um, but my first time in Italy, it was in Pesaro 
in a small city. That's where my son was born. So I really only have, you know, mainly good thoughts about um, Italy, the Italian people, the Italian culture. Um, so that's kind of the stint from after college. But a lot of guys come over and are are extremely arrogant, prideful, have ego, can't adapt well. What type of food is this? Why do they operate like this? Why is this closed between 12 and two o'clock? So, you know, the fathers can go home and eat with their families because that's what they do in Italy. And if you come over here with that attitude, you're going to be back in America really fast. Did you feel like that your, your time in Italy, your stint was, did you feel like that was a place that was a good place for you to transition? Like, is there, is, it, did you see that as a positive being in Italy specifically? Yes, looking back on it, um, the money wasn't good. And that's what I was so frustrated about. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I guess that's every year. So, <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's never <laughs> enough money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, now there is because, you know, I've gotten over thinking that that's the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the happiness for everything when it's really, it has nothing to do with it. It helps. But, um, being where I am now, looking back then, I was just like, oh, man, your ambitions and your goals were all scrambled. But Italy, for sure, because with my son, immediately once my son was born, everything changed. It was just like a, a nitrous moment as far as, OK, this is real deal. And if I get injured and I don't have enough money to support my family at the time, then, you know, I'm going to be in a tough spot. But thank God I didn't get injured. And um so, yeah, I would think, but I got bought out of the, uh, the Italian contract uh, by South Korea and South Korea was interesting. I was going to say, that's quite the transition. So uh, take us through that <laughs> in terms of the process of being brought out and not only going from Italy to South Korea. Man, I was, I was putting up crazy. I, I actually tried out for the, um, the South Korean league. I almost said North Korean league. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, with Dennis Rodman. You're already, you're already approved. So you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You're already on. In fact, I think actually I hear Tony and I probably could make that. So that's yeah, not yeah, a good. Yeah. No, yeah. I still couldn't. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But I tried out for the KBL at the time. Um, it was like a summer. Um, you come in for tryouts. It's the biggest sham uh, smoking mirrors you will ever see. Um, so I played, I thought I was doing decent. I thought I, over over overachieved and I ended up not getting drafted and um the money was good and that's kind of I think it was like six at that time it was like six months for 200,000 or 250 something or 175,000 and I remember at the draft looking over to the guy next to me I was like yo is that a lot of money overseas and he was like for six months are you crazy like anybody's <laughs> hopping on that <laughs> and I was like oh man all right. Okay. So I was like, you know, I don't know how much a lot of money is. I know, but I don't really know. Um, so then after that, uh, I get the, the, the same team I was supposed to tra draft me, the LG Sakers, they come and they call my Italian team and I'm telling the boys like, yo, I'm about to be up out of here. Like, I don't know what you guys are going to do, but this little, I think I was making 4,400 a month at the time. I was like, you know, I, this is a no brainer. Like I am gone. And then it fell through. And then two weeks later they called back and they were like, all right, what do you want for the buyout? My Italian team did not want to give me up. So they said, pick a number. They picked $75,000. We wake up the next morning, they've already wired it to them. So at this point, my Italian team is trying to run an interference and basically telling the fans, because, you know, I was beloved. It's a small city, you know, and I'm the best player on the team. Um, and they're all like on the internet going absolutely crazy. They're just messaging me this and that. Oh, you decided to take the money, you know, this, this and that. I didn't care, but it was just the way that that was the first time that I seen how countries or how teams in Europe like to save face. And it wasn't the first time and I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be the last time. And I got it. I'm like, you know, um, you guys got a $75,000 bio. You guys ended up bringing in Austin Day. You beat Milan a few weeks later. Everything is good, you know. Um, but yeah, that was that whole situation. But once I landed in South Korea, it was freezing cold, like alerts to your phone telling you don't go outside for any reason. Um, yeah, it was it was that cold. Um, and then so but South Korea was it was different, man. It was different. That's the one place that was completely different. It was quite the experience for sure. What was different about it? What's something you can point to as an example? It's a hundred things like you got to understand, like in South Korea, they have a huge market for sending players to the MLB. 
So immediately, like mm -hmm. the MLB players and the basketball players stay in the same compound. It's kind of like, oh, it's like, I want to say it's dorms, but dorms have nothing on this. It's kind of like the, the a small scale of like what of Apple or Google, like um, their little hubs where, you know, that they build for the company where everybody comes. It's kind of like that because you, it's, it's, um, it's, it's in Changwon, the city of Changwon, like uh, 30, 45 minutes from Seoul. And um, it's like a long windy road. You go in, you, you, you can't drive there. You have your own driver. Um, just to give you the breakdown of what it was like, um, you have a, they give you a credit card uh, with uh, $2,000 that you can spend on anything throughout the month. So you never really spend your salary. Uh, you spend it on food, gas, whatever. At that time, alcohol. So it was just like, you know, <laughs> whatever. It was so cold. So um, that's what I'm blaming it on. But um, <laughs> anyways, you, you, you drive in and immediately you see three humongous um, baseball fields and you're still driving forward to the compound. You get to the compound, you walk in, and you're like, okay, where's the gym? You're like in this back corner, because right when you walk in, there's two indoor baseball gyms. It's a cafeteria, um, and it's a chef, and they're just like, whatever you want. And I'm just like, um, uh, the kimchi was like big in, in, in South Korea. Um, I tried it. It was okay, but I would just always be like, yo, can I get chicken wings? So they would just always give me chicken every like single day. Um, but the KBL, that league is so high class because it's like, it's not like traditional. You go on the road, you play, you may be going for 16 days and play eight or nine games in that span. So that's how it was set up there. You stay in hotels, you get to order room service, whatever you want. It was one of the biggest blunders, of course, besides the Grand Canaria tweets, but it was one of the biggest blunders that I had in my career, not uh, taking that for granted, well, taking that for granted and not taking it serious because I could have built such an amazing career over there with less, less taxing on my body and more, more money over the long run. You know, um, you can play it to your 37, 38, and it's not really a high level, but I'm coming in as a rookie, you know, and I'm just like, show me the money. So they bought me out for 75,000. I think I got like 60 or 70,000 for two months of play. Um, so that was the highlight, but you no, know, it's an amazing league over there. But in Changwon, you know, the menus are all in um, Korean. But once you get to Seoul, that was the first place where I walked into a McDonald's and it was no workers besides the people behind there handing the food um, because everything was electronic, uh, electronically done. So, and it was like that in a lot of places there, there Seoul is so, so much further ahead to me than any other place that I've seen in the world besides maybe Tokyo and I've never been there. But as far as my team was LG Electronics, so they're sending it to my Chase account and saying from LG Electronics. And um, they gave me a free Android, and that's when I, I used Android for like three or four years after that, because I was like, man, I just never knew that <laughs> Androids were this good. I was on the iPhone hype, and my wife has gotten me back, but I'm trying to get off soon, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so you did okay in your short stint in South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, did okay. I mean, 16.1 okay. points per game. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, after South Korea, you did, the, you, you mentioned Summer League. Uh, Utah Jazz for a little bit. Uh, then you went into Turkey, uh, mm -hmm. where you participated in the Champions League. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your time with uh, USAC Sportif. Uh, well, before that, I went to the like this 30 man uh, jazz camp. I'm like, all right, I'll give Summer League another try. Mm -hmm. And you liked I it so there. much the first time. Yeah, I liked it so much. The <laughs> <laughs> it was the first class um, flights to. To Utah, but I've I, also been to, to a Lake jazz City. camp, but it was not Utah. No, I'm just kidding. Gotcha. <laughs> that was good. That was good. We, we, just, lost, we just lost all of our listeners. <laughs> all, all three of them. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. The Utah Jazz, great organization. I get there. I already know I'm on the summer league camp, uh, team, but everybody else is a little nervous. Like everybody, this is their big break. We get to the five on five. I get fouled. First free throw, just air ball. Like this was the first and only time in my whole life where this happened. I'm just, I'm just sit, like standing there and I become delirious because I'm like, this is for sure the twilight zone. And that, that like, it was a black mirror moment. So I'm like, what is going on with me? And then the teams come out and I heard some guys were talking, but then, I mean, they, they seen my body at work before that. So I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess I, that kind of made up for it. Um, 
But man, the first time, my first experience in Turkey was to get to Pesaro my first year. So we land at the, the Turkish International Airport. This is when at the height that when they were kind of going through a lot more terrorism, um, you know, they've really cut back on that. They've done an amazing job. Uh, my wife is Turkish, by the way, just to throw that in there. Um, but um, so I land in the, uh, the uh, it's called Sabiha Airport. It's the Oda Airport in uh, Turkey. And I just look out the window and I'm hearing all these things about Turkey and it's like tumbleweeds flying it like to me and it's just smoke every, and dust everywhere. And I'm like, man, get me out of this country. Like I never want to come back to that place. So then um, I was super nervous because I was already um, afraid of flying. And, you know, I think with 9-11, I think every American just kind of always has that thought like, man, you just never kind of know. Um, and we're not in the Middle East, but boy, um, you know, you watch CNN, you watch Fox, you see all these crazy things. So I finally get to Turkey my second year and I'm, I'm completely just blown away by the culture, um, the people, just the sense of calmness, like it, especially in the city that I played in, Ushak, it's like, I would never experience another city like that in my life. And that's for certain. It was just different in everything. Like I, I lived in Istanbul, I lived in Gaziantep, um, and it's, there's no place like Ushak to me because it's a much smaller city inside of Turkey. Um, but it's just different vibes, man. And it was it was amazing. You know, you you kind of always got that looking over your shoulder, like man, anything can go down at any moment. You know, that first year because I just was uneducated. Um, but once once I lived there and I and I seen the people and I experienced the culture. You know, to me, I, I stayed in Istanbul, um, just a side story, me and my wife, uh, not last summer, but the summer before, I only came back to the States for one month. I, I stayed in Turkey for a majority of the summer and um, I loved it, man. It was, it was, you know, Istanbul's a, a humongous city. So it's like, it's nothing like anything. The city of two continents, of course. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I've been on both ends. So um, yeah, man, Turkey. Turkey is amazing and Ushak was also amazing. And why is it why is it Ushak is so amazing to you? I mean, we can certainly go down that road. That's it's interesting to me that you're talking about all these other cities being as great as they are, but what what about it to you makes it so special? I mean, I think I just I just find something and my mind just falls in like in love with the idea of that same routine every day. Like even in Pesaro, it was nothing like Christmas time. Um, just being in that city, I remember it, you know, just kind of walking around and just being like, man, these vibes are crazy here. And it's one of the smallest cities in Italy. And then you go to um, to Ushak and it's just like, it's just so much that happened there, so many memories. And like I said, other guys on the team, they absolutely hated it, but I'm just like, you guys are in a hurry to get back to America to actually do what, you know, to impress other people with the new money that you've gotten um, to, you know, go back and do the same old thing you've always been doing. You got a once in a lifetime opportunity. And, you know, my, my passport is all stamped up. My son's passport is, is stamped up as well. So I'm just like, you know, you guys take this for granted, man, that less than 1% of the world gets to do what we're doing. Exactly. So you you had two separate stints with Turkey, uh, with Spain and Russia in between. I'm sticking with Turkey for a minute, uh, before we get into the the Spain and Russia transition, and then back to Turkey. Um, you played with three different teams, two of which you went to the Champions with uh, Champions League with, mm -hmm. uh, including the powerful Besiktas team, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. you finished up your Turkish league career with. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the differences between those teams, if you could. Okay, so just to clarify, there was three Turkish teams, Ushak, Gaziantep, and uh, yes. Besiktas. Um, all were different levels, like Ushak, that's where I made my name for myself, 30 points on Fenerbahce, Final Four every year, you know, big Euro, big time EuroLeague team. That's when I kind of got my name out there. Um, in Gaziantep, you know, <laughs> we haven't talked about it yet, but I had some rough times, you know, with, between Spain and Russia. So getting there was just kind of like, uh, with Coach Nina, who I also look at as like, man, he's one of the top male figures in my life just because he was the same way, man. No BS. I'm going to tell you how it is. I don't like this. And there's nothing you can do about it besides do what I say. And I was just kind of always one of the guys that noticed like, 
you know, if I listen to the coach, like as hard as I can, I'm going to play the most minutes and I'm going to have the most opportunity. And that's how I am everywhere that I go. You know, I don't go to, you know, create any problems. But um, so the Gazi and Teb stint was good because we didn't play two games a week, but we were a really good team. We were one game out of fourth place and we were picked to be 15th in the league. Um, and we had one of the lowest budgets at the time. Um, in, in Bessie Tosh, I'm newly married to a Turkish woman. I'm in Istanbul. You know, this is the coming home. This is the coming out party. Like, you know, I'm, there's no other way. I'm not going to get more comfortable than this <laughs> overseas. Um, so the freedom that I had, that I developed in Bessie Tosh, because it wasn't always like that, but I just kind of just, I don't know. That was like the lone year where I feel like nothing could stop me. No matter what I went out there, it was going to be 20 plus points with six rebounds and four or five assists, three steals, monster dunks. Um, and I still kind of feel that now, uh, even in EuroLeague, but then it was just a different animal. After being in a country for that long, you become comfortable. So I'm, I'm in the, I'm in, I'm living in one of the richest areas, Etzilar in Istanbul, everything at my fingertips. My wife is Turkish. I don't, I don't have any problems. So it was just, it was just go time. Um, that's why I think that year was the best. Did you meet your wife in Turkey? Yeah, I met my wife in uh, Istanbul. Um, mm. But when I was playing for Gaziantep mm. and um, I was like, um, I met her and I said the first time I met her before. Um, and then I met her again and I was like, uh, yo, I'm about to marry you. Like I just told her that on the first day. And then um, three months later we were married. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So how'd you guys meet the first, first one or two times, I guess. Um, so it was like, a it's this hookah bar and we all had mutual friends. Like everybody out there knows each other. And, uh, you know, she has a lot of tattoos, so she's, a, a, you know, she's extremely noticeable. So, um, I just noticed her in, like in that, um, in that light. And I was just like, who is that girl? You know, I just stayed, stayed my distance because at that time I had a girlfriend. Um, so then things broke off with that. So I was like, all right, now I'm out in Istanbul. I'm just doing whatever, whatever. I think uh, I invited one of her friends to the all-star game in, uh, in Turkey and the friend didn't bring her. She brought a different girl and mm -hmm. I'm just sitting there with my best friend from, uh, from the States. And he's just having the time of his life. He's laughing so hard. And I'm just like, wow. Okay. Whatever. All right. So fast forward. Um, the next day, I'm like, yo, don't ever do that again, friend. Can you bring her this time? <laughs> because <laughs> she she didn't know who I was. She probably had zero interest in me, which I know now for a fact she did have zero interest in me. And, uh, <laughs> but man, I was persistent, man. I was I was I was persistent. And then once I locked it in, I was like, Will you marry me? And I got, you know, I went and bought a ring. And then uh, we got married in Gazi and Tep. Um uh, had a I had a Turkish wedding, uh, not a Turkish wedding, but like the Turkish version of going to the town hall to, I mean, the, the court, the courthouse to get married, but it's not a courthouse. It's more like, it's, it's more religious in my, in my opinion. And um, so that was different. I'll never forget that experience. Um, yeah. That's yeah. part of why I wanted to stick with Turkey before heading back to the harder times you had in Spain and Russia. Cause it does seem like, you know, Turkey has been very good to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And sure. yeah, no, Turkey has been good to me and, I just want to get to that level. I, I always want to play for either Finnebach or Ephes, but being at Olympiacos now, it's like the first time you taste blood, you want more of it. So I'm just like, I want to stay here for the rest of my career. You know, I'm like, I'm comfortable mm -hmm. here. It's an hour flight to Istanbul. Um, so, you know, so that's that. But yeah, that that's the situation with my wife. It was a lot of cat and mouse and I was, I was the cat. <laughs> <laughs> and as you mentioned before, that's her uh, streaming Call of Duty in the background. Yeah, that, yeah she's... She's a Twitch streamer and she just, man, she, I like, for me, she does all the things I wanted to do. YouTube and she opens up a YouTube, 2,500 subscribers. Twitch, I open it up to my Olympiacos fans and they're like, let's watch the Olympiacos games. I'm like, I want to play Call of Duty. I get five, six uh, concurrent viewers. She cuts the camera on. I'm heading off to practice. I, I pull it up on my phone at a stoplight. Okay, only 17 streamers. Five minutes later, I get to my locker. She's up to 170, and I'm like, oh, my God, this can't be that easy. I mean, my one of my dreams, like, I got my wife set, like, with all her social media stuff. But as I told you, like, I've always been into cameras. I've always been into microphones, always been into music, always been into different things. So it's, like, um, it's hard. And it's just, like, me, I'm trying to jump the broom as far as, okay, now it's my turn to get it going. My wife is, 
is, you know, kicking my ass. I'm sorry for my language. So it's like, we got her going, now it's my turn. Um, but now I, I'm realizing <laughs> how hard it is. And it is. I'm just like, you know, it, it, it's really hard. And it's like my, my social, and, uh, my um, manager, uh, like the media manager at Olympiacos is like, cause I, I always wanted to start a, a podcast, you know, Smick 77, Shaq McKissick 77. Um, and I have big ambitions for my brand. And she's like, you know, you know, I can get, you know, you a conversation with Giannis. And I'm just like, the first time she said, it, I was like, you know, immediately I went back to that, that, the, the, the summer league, like, yo, I'm not ready for the NBA, yet, you know, <laughs> but then I, you know, I, but I always remind myself, like, I can't get back into that pattern, even if I get into him and, or, or get there with him and, and it's five minutes and he says, no, you're out of your mind. I've never done a podcast before and you're not going to be the first one. I'd be like, all right, you know, it, it is yeah. what it is, you know, it just falls off me now. But back in the day, yeah, I, I'd be petrified, but I'm, I'm ready to go now. For sure. Yeah. Um, so actually, one of the things that I noticed you want to start some of my prep with this has been that you did your first blog, I think, eh, probably about two, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good transition as well. Is that something that we're going to see from you going forward? Yeah, the second episode is already locked and loaded. Um, it's just the thing, man. I'm, I feel like I'm such a creator that something comes out and I see the direction is going in. It's like, ah, I don't know if I want to go in that direction. So that's kind of this the the part that we're at with um my cameraman aka my director um chris we we had a conversation i was like i want to do something else like i'm building a brand out here in athens clothing um uh twitch um you know beyond meat sponsorship stuff like that i'm like i want you to sit in on those meetings and i want to show people how hard or how easy it can be just by just saying simple email to beyond meat one of the biggest vegan um meat packaging companies you know and they have amazing food i just emailed them Hey, I, I play for Olympiacos. Can I have a sponsor? All right, come in for a meeting. We, we sponsor a bunch of NBA guys. We would love to sponsor you. And that was the first one. And it's like, I'm getting around to like the monsters and the, um, you know, other type kind of gaming companies um, to start emailing them. Cause I'm just like, I got to look the part, you know, <laughs> I just can't be over here like, yo, buy my clothes. Um, and, and, you know, not have something, not have something for people to look forward to, you know, yeah. um, I pride myself on attention. I read, read a lot of books about branding. So I know where it's at. It's just the execution part. Exactly. So so with your second blog, what can we look forward to with that before we go back and what's actually already out? Gotcha. The, um, the second episode. The second one, I, I talk a little bit about, about my friend that passed in, um, in France. Um, and it's just kind of the meaning of life. It's a Kobe episode. It, it's going to be called Kobe because um, there's a court here on a rooftop and uh, Kobe spray painted on it. Um, so I just kind of talk about a little bit about Kobe's career and just um, how you can't take things for granted. And then I transition into talking about um, my friend Jermaine Marshall, who passed and it's just kind of one of those stories. But I'm like, man, the first episode was amazing. I know this one's amazing. But to keep the attention of people, I just don't want to keep hitting people with these not clickbaity type stuff, but that's what it feels like to me. You know, that's not what I, I don't want everything to be centered around. Oh, look at me now. I want, I want people to see like, no, I'm here and I'm still grinding. And it's hard. It's really hard. It's a bunch of noses, clothing companies that say, yo, we love you. We love you as a player, but we're absolutely backed up two months and there's nothing you can do about it. But hmm. you know, um, sorry, you got to find somebody else. So, um, it's interesting, man. Then you got to deal with the politics of walking into that locker room. And I'm, uh, I don't know if you guys have, um, well, well, you both have jobs that I'm sure that you have outside of podcasting. And it's like, man, you post something. Like when I posted my YouTube video to my page and just walking into the locker room and just feeling that conviction of everybody, like who does he think he is, <laughs> you know, and constantly having to deal with that. Like this guy's, silly for chasing his dreams and doing what he loves to do and that's kind of the killer part of, about everything is just like always having to deal with that 24 7. Hmm. you gotta have thick skin man yeah mm -hmm. so one of the things is actually really we talked a little bit before the pod as well about some of the stuff with criminal justice and your first vlog um really interesting to me uh took the the clip of doc rivers talking about um some of the issues with social justice reform mm -hmm. um, in terms of it's interesting about how a country that, you know, doesn't, I'm paraphrasing, doesn't really, you know, that you love, but it doesn't really love you back. Mm -hmm. What was, what was the inspiration, I guess, 
for for that uh that episode in full other other than other than that clip um i'm not gonna lie i never thought that in my lifetime i would experience something that happened this past summer just from the standpoint of i've lived it i've lived some of those things so to me it's like man, I knew this was the truth, but I never told anybody because it's just like, what is going to change? It was just like, my voice is so small. But when you get a country or um, a group of people to rally around something, as we've seen when Trump got elected uh, four years ago, it can happen. So just to see, you know, both black, white, all ethnicities, you know, races, genders, everybody coming together and just being like, no, this is wrong. Um, I think that shook me. And I, I didn't, I didn't go out and protest. I didn't, um, you know, I, I, I posted um, a few um, tweets or, you know, retweeted a few things. I just said in the background because it's different. I'm, I'm trying to find the right words to say because I don't really want to offend anybody. But I, all I can say is I've lived it. So the best way for me to do it is through my creativity, however that is. So I feel like with that first vlog, I just opened up to a lot of people's eyes out here in Europe, like, we knew what was going on, but now this is one of your prominent players that play in EuroLeague telling you, this is true. <laughs> you know, he's doubling down on it. And the things that I've seen in jail, the things that I've seen with solitary confinement and just being in a room with no windows for three days and you're just getting a tray slid through your door, it does stuff to you, especially your mind. And it's just like, for me, it just focused me up, man. I, it, it just it just created laser focus. Like I remember those rooms vividly, all of them. And it's just like the conditions that we're living in, I get it, it's jail, but my God, it's, it's, it's criminals at the highest level, CEOs of banks, um, you know, <laughs> in the, uh, you know, stockbrokers, whoever it may be that I heard living this amazing life, but just because I wasn't, you know, afforded that opportunity you know, and now it's the same opportunity that I have to deal with with my son to be like, you know, he's going to grow up, his dad's going to have some type of um, leeway, you know, as far as he's good in this, the countries that I played in, you know, if they, if, if he needs to come play here, or if he gets into trouble, I have the money to get him out of it. But it's just like, it's a two edged sword, surely. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things with, I think a lot of people don't necessarily have an understanding of just how awful jails are uh mm -hmm. in this country mm -hmm. i mean yeah i'm sure there's other countries where it's worse but um and it might have had an impact on you or that you might have been somebody that was able to pull through it and decide to make the decision this is not the direction i want to go but it is so easy to be trapped in a cycle with that especially if you just don't have the resources Listen. and nobody's really going to give you the, the time of day and just judge you from there. So I, I completely understand that. And uh, that, that was something that for me, I, I was actually listening to, uh, I was watching the NBA play. I don't even remember specifically which one it was with the Clippers, but just when that came on, it just got my attention. And then for you to have opened that up with your vlog was just, it's, it's still been one of the most powerful statements of mm -hmm. loving a country and not being loved back. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it just can kind of gut you. I mean, I, I don't know if you had a question, Tony, or had a comment before I go again. No, go ahead. Um, it's just, I recognize I'm in an extreme anomaly. After living through that, and when I go back to that, I just think of everybody else. And it's not survivor's remorse or survivor's guilt, whatever you want to call it. It's more like, like what I did was almost near to impossible <laughs> in of course, it was a different type of impossible, but I had to be born with the right athletic ability to be able to rebound and uh, and be like, okay, I haven't played basketball for all these years, but I can just get right back into it. And at the same time, I have to have the know-how or to be like, okay, I'm going to figure out a way to get out of this situation. And it's just like every step of the way was just like, whew, almost didn't make it. But then I look back to all the guys who didn't make it, like, if I didn't have money, I wouldn't be able to put my name on the lease. If I didn't have money, I wouldn't be able to get it own, own my own car. I mean, I could, but if they do a background check, I'm screwed. If I own money, I have to lie on every single, um, you know, application that I put in just because I've been in jail. And it's just like, man, I get it. What I did was wrong, man. You gotta, you gotta have some accountability. But if I have accountability, and even for the guys who don't have accountability, 
they still they they still deserve a chance, just like all the other regular people out here that also don't have accountability, who don't get caught doing terrible things or just are shitty people. I mean, if we're just being honest, and it's just like jail humbles you like no other place. Everybody asks me how was jail. I say what you see in the movies is exactly like that. Whatever whatever you see in the movies, that's going on somewhere in the world, one thousand percent. I had a question. Once you got into these uh, sorts of social justice commentary that you had been doing, what's been the reaction of uh, people at, like your teammates and whatnot that are from other countries? I mean, they don't really speak on it because I mean, it's so in your face right now that it's kind of hard to miss. Um, so I haven't really gotten into those conversations. And to be quite frank, they have so much going on in their own countries for me to even try to bring that to their plate. They're going through some type of prejudice um, in their own countries, not quite racism, but some type of prejudice towards another uh, group of people or something. And it, I'm not, and I call it like I see it, you know, a lot of people are like, how can they do that in America? It's happening everywhere. It's not just America. Like it, it, it happened with Hitler, you know, in, you know, not too long ago, it, it happens in every country. It's just, it just looks a little different every time. Um, but if they ask me about it, which some do, but it's mainly the coaches, um, they, they try to get a grasp of it. Um, and I'm just like, man, it's, it's nothing like it. I mean, you know, you, you <laughs> I don't know, but every black person feels like it's the same old thing. And, you know, it's hard, it's hard to be only 16, I think, percent of the population somewhere and think you have a, or should have a dominant voice, especially after the, the history of the country. But like I said, man, everybody has to be willing to take ownership. You talked about some of the, the good in terms of Turkey um, and how good that country has been to you. But like we mentioned in the, in the commentary that um, you had Spain and Russia in between your Turkey stints. And um, you even mentioned some of the, the adversity you went through with Gran Canaria. Um, why don't you take us through Spain and Russia and uh, what your experiences there were, for better or for worse? Okay. Um, Spain. Spain was first. Okay. Um, Spain was amazing. You know, um, I'm living on, you know, in Las Palmas, uh, Canary Islands, Gran Canaria, stuff I heard about. Uh, you know, only in people's dreams, like, yo, we go vacation there, you know, um, Canary Islands or whatever. So I get there. It's amazing. But this coach, I don't know what it was from day one. He just did. I think what ha happened was I had my Azerbaijan passport, but it didn't get clear for the ACB. So I automatically counted as American. So I don't know if he wanted me to get up out of there and, you know, to bring somebody else in, but those were 100% the vibes. And looking back on it, I did 1 million things wrong to put myself in that situation. But I think at the time I was splitting up or I was off and on my son's mother and that also played a huge part into, into everything that was going on. Because at that point in my life, after jail and after going through everything I went through, I was always happiness first. So, if I wasn't happy in the situation, the nuclear bomb was about to go off. And I kept telling my agent, yo, please get me out of here. And he'll, he'll admit to this. I called him five or six times before I actually blew up. And it just took Luka Doncic scoring 13 on me or something like that to really send me over the edge <laughs> finally. <laughs> but um, yeah, man. So the story in Gran Canaria goes, um, we just had played Madrid. This is after the coaches berated me all season uh, so far. So to rewind, me and him actually got into a physical altercation in a game um, in Zenit, uh, actually where I'm going in Russia, in St. Petersburg. He, um, he kind of gave me a tap. So I gave him a love tap back. And then we were kind of both just doing this to each other. Like nobody wanted to cross that line. I'm like, yo, I promise you, this isn't what you want to do. But um, so we get into it. That was actually one of my best games of the season after that halftime. I, I went in there with like two points and I finished like 15 points. And he blamed me for missing a defensive assignment, which he later apologized for that week saying, you're right, I was wrong. But that's kind of what it was like the whole season. So we get to Madrid, we lose to Madrid. Everything's okay, I'm not even nuclear level yet. We go back to the room, my roommate forgets his backpack in the, in the, the dinner room. So he goes back in there and all he hears is McKissick this, McKissick that. And it's like a festival in there, a circus. They're just laughing it up. And I'm just laughing at me. And this is this is all he say, she say from my teammate. But 
I'm like, how could he make this up? And why would he make this up? Um, but side note, I learned an important lesson to never ever do that to one of my teammates because he was 100%, he should have never told me that, you know, um, at least not in the way that he did. It, and me and him are still cool to this day, but I kind of just look at him kind of funny. Like, I'm just like, uh, so I learned a lesson from that. Like I never, you know, kind of like gossipy with stuff like that because it altered my whole life, like my whole trajectory. I was already at Euro Cup. If I have a decent season there, maybe I'm Euro League there three years ago. So, which they eventually going, they won the playoffs and they eventually moved up to Euro League. So funny how that works out. So, anyways, I I get that night. I get extremely drunk. I go out to the club. I get drunk. While it's a few wild stories in there with taxi drivers and other stuff that I was being told that happened. So. I'm in the airport, kind of tipsy, feeling good. And I just get on Twitter and I just voice my opinions. And I, I don't think I've read those tweets since that day, just because it's just like super cringy. It's just like, oh my God, that, that is nasty stuff. For you to even be in that mindset and to tweet that, you know, half drunk. And then I remember landing, we land, we land uh, in Gran Canaria. You know, I took the tweets as the plane was like this. So we had no Wi-Fi connection for two and a half hours. We land in Gran Canaria. My son's mother was coming to pick me up. So I already knew I had my ride. Yo, I, the, the flight lands and all you hear is ping, 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 ping. Like this through everybody's phone. I do this and I'm already like 303 retweets and I've, um, I, or favorites and likes and all the blogs and everybody picked it up and it was just a sense of relief man I was just like finally like <laughs> I guess I'm getting up out of here and um I, I'll never forget this scene I'm walking to go get my luggage I'm the only person at the carousel the whole team is standing back like in the hallway and I'm looking at them like you haven't lived my life so you don't <laughs> like whatever all right I just take my bag and I just go home and from that point my life slowly started to get back on track. It was it was a it was a rocky <laughs> lift off after that, but that that was one of those defining moments in my life where I was like, that was the first time where I was like, wow, that's what true ultimate freedom feels like. Never again though. <laughs> and so you end up through that situation in Spain. You head over to Russia. Yeah, Russia was Russia was Russia, man. It was everything I thought it was going to be. It's one of those places, it's just cold, you know, it's cold. And all the players that go there, it's just cold, it's often dark, and all you got is alcohol at that point. And that's just kind of what it was like. Not every night, but it was a lot of drinking during that period of my life, just because it was just like, after those tweets and everybody being like, oh, he just ruined his career, his career's over, oh, this, this, and that. Just like, man, you guys don't know my past. I promise you, it could have got, it could have been a lot worse. Maybe if I lost a leg, but I'm just like, nah, I, I've been through much worse. This isn't anything. It's all about perspective. Yeah. So, okay. From Russia, go back to Turkey, which we, we kind of got into, uh, wound off um, in Champions League uh, at the very beginning of this year in February. Uh, about nine days later, signed with Olympiacos. What was the, was there any sort of conversation with your agent or, or um, how did that all come together so quickly? Man, um, if you let the, my Turkish teammates tell it, it was all my wife's doing. It was all some voodoo type stuff <laughs> because she's Turkish, they're Turkish. And I was like, she knows too much. <laughs> so I'm just like, Granted, she did want me to go to Olympiacos, but who wouldn't want that opportunity? Um, so Olympiacos had came calling a couple months before and they ended up signing Octavius Ellis. So then uh, Spanulis went down. So they had an open vacancy and then they just, uh, it just worked out. It just so happened that when they needed a player, I set out because I wasn't getting paid. So legally I was able to leave but for me to leave, I had to come to an agreement with my team. Like, okay, you pay me this X amount of dollars and then you get to go to, you know, you get to leave the Olympiacos. And um, I had a vacation, me and my wife had a vacation plan for France. We had like 10 days off or something like that. So everything was booked, everything, we were ready to go. And we ended up in Athens. <laughs> so um, not too far off, I guess, but um, 
so yeah that's how that went down hmm. um in your recent vlog you going back to that you kind of discussed some of the harder aspects of being a pro um you mentioned obviously the positives of playing overseas the places the money but you also contrast that really well with what some of the drawbacks are mm-hmm. um if you don't mind could you go through some of that for our listeners yeah i mean it's just a simple fact that you know when I find out that my mom had breast cancer, I'm over here. When I find out my big brother has a brain tumor, I'm over here. When I find out my sister has lupus, I'm over here. When my little brother gets diagnosed with schizophrenia, I'm over here. So I think for me, I was just, I'm, I am just fed up just with this. It's to me, I, this is the thing. If I'm able to live out what I want to do as far as dreams and aspirations and not have to be a robot, then that's kind of some give back. But I'm not, I refused to come over here this year and be like, you can't become a gamer. You can't start a vlog. You can't start a clothing company in Athens. What are you talking about? You can't brand and market yourself. No, you need to just play basketball over here. And when it's all said and done, you go get a coaching job or you go do this or you go do that. You start over in America. Not for what I've given up. So I think everybody understands Shaq off the court is going to do what Shaq does. Win, lose, draw. If you're going to send Shaq home, Shaq is going to be content. And I think that ultimately also helps me play better because I know, like, I can go out here and I'm just going to give it all I got. If it doesn't work out for 30 straight games and I average two points, I get to go be with my family. So for me, you got – I think everybody has to set up those boundaries in their life. Like, even if there was no money involved – I would much rather be happy and be spending time with family. And that's what I was so thankful for quarantine and for my wife that she got her visa, her green, well, she's getting her green card, but she got her 10 year visa. So we were able to go back to Indianapolis and just, man, just be with my son, um, him be around all his cousins in Indianapolis and just to watch them play, having sleepovers and doing stuff like that. It was, it was for sure the break I needed. Hmm. So um, one last thing in regards to your, career with hoops and then we're going to get into um some other stuff um you mentioned briefly earlier you have the azerbaijani passport Mm -hmm. uh that that came your way in june 2017 Mm -hmm. uh tell us a little bit about how that came about how you ended up with an aziri passport and then how you your stint with the azerbaijan national basketball team and what that was like gotcha it was weird baku (laughs) is an (laughs) baku is an amazing amazing i promise you it's one of the cleanest cities, but also, according to them, one of the most corrupt cities. But to me, Baku was an amazing city. I will never forget that city. Just their architect, their building. They have like these building of flames, and it's just like three big skyscrapers that are built like flames centered around each other. It's, it's amazing right there on the water. They have like a Grand Prix that runs through the city, so you can you can see it when you go there. Um, it's amazing. But um, it was weird. The whole thing was sketchy from top to bottom, and that's why the ACB never... Um, gave that passport approval and that's also why no country gives it approval now Um, so they canceled my Azerbaijan passport last year when I didn't go to the three-on-three tournament because I figured out I practiced with them and then I was told it's not going to count for anything so I said I'm not giving up time with my wife to go do this I'm not giving up time for my son to go to to go do this nonsense just that maybe it might work out and it ended up not working out so um, that was the whole thing with that um, but shout out Samet because he's the one that, that found me and gave me that opportunity. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful for um, going to Baku. It was, it was amazing. Hmm. Andy, this is a good time for lighting the mood a little bit. Uh, yeah. Let's talk trash talk, shall we? Yeah. So we started a segment one time and it's kind of been a recurring thing ever since then. I don't know if you ever heard um, the Larry Bird uh merry fucking christmas uh uh-huh. trash talk story have you uh, no i haven't heard that all right so this is the way we're we're labeling it this because i mean some of the other people that have trash talk like kevin garnett that gets a little too intense so uh-huh. that's why we're not na- naming, naming that way but uh larry bird i think it was a christmas day game uh one time where i don't remember the team that they're playing during a timeout they're coming back from a timeout he leans over and tells the entire opposing team's bench hey i got you guys a christmas present they're like okay what and so the game action goes he winds up hitting a three right in front of their bench turns around and goes merry fucking christmas um so that's what we're naming this what's your what's your best trash talk story that you can recall man 
Um, man, that's that's a good question. I I rarely get trash talked, man. And I and I I don't talk to anybody on the court. So I'm I'm trying to think of who. I mean, Bobby Dixon at Fenerbahce. He, me and him kind of got into a thing, but it it wasn't at all. It was me accidentally elbowing him. And then, you know, it just kind of ended there. <laughs> he gave me this look and I was like, yo, it was an accident. But as far as every, I, I really don't have any trash talking. I don't know if it's because people respect the story that I've been through and they just know my past and they just don't want to mess with it. But I get more like on the courts, I get a lot of, yo, man, I'm so happy for you that, that, you, that you're giving this opportunity. I get so many of those, but trash talking, nothing come my mind is blank when it comes to it i promise you i'm sorry well, about we that. could always we could always circle back to it but one of the things that when we had mike morrison on earlier he was saying that uh he thinks that trash talk is kind of going a little bit on the decline but one of the interesting stories that he gave us was uh i'm blanking on the last name aaron it was one of his canadian teammates uh said this isn't like one of those things where you're really looking like for a really deep edge or anything to the trash talk but uh -huh. it was just really clever he guess would go up to when there was a player, you know, about to shoot a free throw and they'd have their hand on the ball. He'd go like, you, you put your, you put your thumb on the ball there. Uh, gotcha. and, and like, so then the person starts thinking about it. It's like just super clever. Like, it's not like, Oh wow. That really cut me deep, but wait, how am I shooting this? And so then they start thinking about that. Yeah, so that's, gotcha. that's one of the ones that I've been rewarded. We've been rewarded with so far. Gotcha. No, that's killer. Um, I guess at the free throw line, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that because if somebody sees this and they try to <laughs> they try to use it against me, but yeah, I've had my share of free throw demons for sure. And it's just <laughs> it's nothing to do with the guys on the court, man. It's always the guys on the sidelines of the other team. And I'm always listening for it. Just a hey yo or just a whoop whoop, some just crazy. And I'm like, I'm about to miss this free throw. <laughs> like those those are my big ones for sure. I cannot I cannot handle those. Oh my god. Um, what, uh, on that note too, you're talking about the, the guys on the sideline, the players you've played in Turkey. You're now in Greece. Those are mm -hmm. places that are notorious for mm -hmm. fan behavior mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is distracting and sometimes mm -hmm. dangerous. Uh, what yeah, are some no. things that you've seen from people in those two locations in particular? Craziness, man. The first time we beat Fenerbahce, my first game in Turkey, um, playing in, you know, the Turkish league. And I had like 30 or 31 or something like that. And it was just like, and it was a home game. So it was just flipped upside down. Like it was packed out. I'll never forget that scene. Like it was people on top of people on top of people. And we beat them and it was just like, all right, here goes the keys to the city. Everybody knew who I was. Um, the Olympiacos versus uh, Pana game, which is one of the biggest rivalry in the history of sports as far as two teams not liking each other. Um, and during the game, it's a net around the court. So you can't, no fans can come on and it's just security um the police escort everything is just backed up on the highway and that's why I'm so bummed out about COVID because that experience is unmatched and I became an instant celebrity in Greece just off of that one game hmm. wow. yeah yeah granted it was an amazing performance but I mean I guess I just lucked out I was just <laughs> lucky once again as far as that destiny yeah, we've had people that have played in Turkey, played in Greece in the past. The videos are online. I mean, that stuff, it's, it's unparalleled in terms of actually playing experience. There's nothing like that in the U.S. at all. Like no, nothing, not there, there's, there's nasty rivalries, but in terms yeah. of the actual actions of the people, there's nothing. There's nothing like that at all. No, no. Like they actually last year in, it was a Pan again, Panathiakos, um, I think the referee, some uh some bikers pulled up to the side of his taxi and broke the window he had to go to the hospital this is oh, euro league wow. you know <laughs> like this is euro league and they had to come on like we denounce all such actions and i'm like yeah i think everybody does but you you have those bad apples but it's a lot of bad apples when it comes to these <laughs> properties, man. just fire in the stands and it's just like you this is what happens you'll play a game with that many people both in turkey and greece you go into halftime you come out and it's just smoke everywhere and it's just like Oh, you guys, uh, no, the no smoking signs are broke. Everybody's just lighting up in the crowd, just <laughs> waiting for the action to get back. Smoke break, it's just stuffy in there, secondhand smoke. But you know, for you can't be that experience. <laughs> You're not gonna find that anywhere. No, no, no doubt. There's there's nothing <laughs> like that in the U.S. And that's that's something that only people who play overseas can really speak to. Yeah, but that's um, the thing about them, like 
Americans come like when I when I go back home, they think we're playing for pennies. They think it just doesn't matter. They just think like it's not a big deal. And then especially at this level, it's like, man, it's do or die. <laughs> you know, a lot of this stuff is do or die. Coaches losing their jobs left and right. Players being getting sent home all the time. It's a doggy dog world over here for sure. Yeah, I mean, most players that we've talked to, two years is like a maximum amount of time that you're playing with one a single team, not necessarily yeah, a league. Yeah, Guys yeah. spend a lot of time as leagues, but they're going on and on. They're churning their way through a lot of teams. And I, I mean, your experience is no different. You've played for lots of different teams, mostly one year contracts and that kind of stuff whenever you're needed. So there's a lot to play for, for sure, yeah, for, yeah, for you guys yeah. playing overseas. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, like I said, the money's good. You know, the money's kind of always been good, but these guys over here making insane amounts of, uh, you know, of money. And I'm just like, the only way I'm gonna get there is if I relax, man, <laughs> and just go with the flow. It's a lot of guys come over here, they overthink it and they just burn out, you know? So you get, you, it, it's a lot of weird superstitions over here. Like for, for players and coaches, like it, I've seen some rituals that are crazy. Okay. Now you're going to have to talk about yeah. it. <laughs> You're not gonna. You're not gonna get away without letting uh, them. <laughs> All right, I'm. I'm trying to. Man, it's just like superstition. Like, say for my coach now. Like, I think like we have a starting lineup. We lost the first game. He puts in this new starting lineup, and it's just like until we lose again, this is the starting lineup. And until and, and it's just like even previous coaches. It's like I'm trying to think of one off the head, but it's just like. because of some stuff that I don't want to get into because I get it. It's, it's to do with something else. And it's just like, I don't want to speak on that on air because that's, a, that's their lifestyle, but it's just like, well, that's, I never seen that before. And these are like elite players. And it's like, wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. That, that's pretty weird, but I get it though. I get it. But some, some guys are just like, I eat the same thing before every game, the night before every game, I have to do this. I have to do this. Um, And I'm just like, man, you guys put so much pressure on yourselves and you give your, your subconscious so many excuses to be like if one of these things don't go right I'm about to have an awful game and that's why I just don't give it only the, the, what I do is three hours before the game beet juice and then 10 minutes before the game I have my Starbucks right there courtside four or five espressos with a hint of sugar and just shotgun it and it's just like that's just that and I'm not gonna lie if I didn't have either one of those I would be in panic mode so I can only imagine what these guys are going through it's interesting. I was going to say that one of the things that comes to mind in terms of uh, Ben Gordon is somebody that I think has recently kind of discussed about some of like his mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really, I don't know, I hadn't thought about it that way in terms of sometimes, you know, professional athletes or, or just athletes, I guess I should say, they'll, some of the behaviors are something that you think about, like as a basketball player that might make you good in terms of, uh, you know, repetitively doing some tasks or over practicing or things like that, that you, you think about it from a basketball standpoint or a sports standpoint. And you're like, Oh, that's what you want from an athlete to repetitively do that. Mm -hmm. But then also when you're thinking about it from a mental health standpoint, you're like, maybe that's not the best idea um, oh, it's or, insane. Or, or what's going on. So that was, that was something that's even probably from a pregame ritual or something like that, you're probably getting it. Like you said, putting so much pressure on yourself, probably I mean, is not, not the best thing like we're not snipers like I, I get if you had a job where your focus had to be mentally sharp every single second but no man you're supposed to be having fun with everything that you do any job that you have like I'm sure that's why you guys picked the podcast and you'd be like this is way funner than my real job <laughs> so, exactly <laughs> so it's like guys coming here and they're so serious and it's like I, I gotta be a different person on game day because I have to act like I'm focused up too but I'm you know, I'm shooting around before the game, earphones, and I could be listening to anything from Miley Cyrus to a podcast to <laughs> just just all types of random stuff. And then when it's game time, I'm like, all right, it's time now it's time to get between the lines. You know, we didn't done the practices all week. So why are we killing ourselves to to put double pressure? Not to uh, self-promote, but do you intend to add X Pack Hoops to your uh, free game podcast listening? <laughs> By the way, in my profession, we're always told don't ask the question you don't already know the answer to. You're like Tony, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> no man, but um, no, I, I, I got bigger. I got bigger plans for this interview, man. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm pretty sure I can get more exposure than that than just me listening to it. 
So yeah, we're just two guys who don't exactly know what we're doing, but we had the equipment and we had an idea and we've been super rewarded so far and just want to keep going. Um, and it's Man, you guys much further than me and I have all the resources at my disposal, but I'm, I'm going to catch you guys soon. Don't worry. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's gonna be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are gonna have to be um, come be guests on my podcast, and we'll oh, just talk about. I, I would absolutely be willing to do that too. Are you what, sure what, you guys? Boy, you really are <laughs> sounding like you don't know what you're doing if you're talking about having us as guests. On your podcast. No, 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 because because if I ask if I ask an athlete about aliens and religion and what's really going on, I don't I don't get the res- I get the politically you know correct response. So I'm just like. That's why I hate athlete interviews and podcasts and stuff like that, because it's just all repetitive. Of course, the guys have interesting stories and interesting things about their life. But like, no, let's get down to the meat of of life, actually. (laughs) What's really going on out here, you know, because people want to hear that perspective. You know, you hear, you know, that's why I respect Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving so much. It's weird and it's quirky and just they do all the wrong things. They do what they want to do. They say what they want to do. They live how they want to live. So you can only respect that at the end of the day. And who's to say they're wrong? Besides scientists with the flat earth. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but he debunked that itself. So yeah, Tony and I have had that discussion. That's also why you're getting such a hearty laugh from that is because we're like, well, actually, I'm okay. Kyrie is an interesting guy. And I mean that oh, in man. a positive way, as well as like, okay, there's some some stuff. But like the fact that he's not just some jock like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know with the oh one one thing that he's doing i mean there's plenty of other things that he has done that are good yeah Mm -hmm. the flat earth thing that's a little off the mark yeah 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 yeah, yeah, but (laughs) but he is an interesting guy and same thing like kevin durant i mean he's got a lot of business interests and everything like that he's he's not just some you know dumb jock again what's Mm -hmm. somebody that he's somebody that has a personality got some character and oh by the way he happens to play basketball at a really high level yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's hard to tell those guys no just to, to about anything, but no, they're, they're two quirky individuals and that's why it works for them. And it's just like, it's just always that constant feeling like you're for sure trolling us. I know you're trolling right now and they just live for it. And Kyrie has YouTube rabbit hole written all over him. So I can respect that though. My, my yeah. brother's the same way, just always a conspiracy, just always. And I'm just like, yeah but no <laughs> you know what everything is a conspiracy and it's just killer so all right so i i don't know if we necessarily have any other expat hoops questions but we could certainly go off the rails on expat extras if you want oh let's do it that was Shaq McKissick. He's currently playing hoops for powerhouse Greek squad Olympiakos in Athens. That was a fun interview. You can follow him on their easy-to-find social media channels. Just one last reminder, you can also find our interviews on YouTube, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts, and on giantkiller.co. Be sure to follow us on social media like Twitter and Facebook for the latest on who we're talking to next. We're also on IG and occasionally get pics from our interviewees you won't see anywhere else, so follow us there as well. For Andy Hoverman, I'm Tony Budney. Tune in next time to Expat Hoops.